What's been up since we last talked? Uh, I think, yeah, it was probably about a month ago now, our last interview. Yeah, yeah, no, um, uh, like some of your uh, members might remember, I was working on my postgraduate certificate of education, so I can teach um, sixth form history and public services here in the UK, and uh, that has now, well, I've turned in the last assignment. I won't say it's finished yet, but uh, but at least there's a, uh, no more papers to write. Yeah, so it must be a busy time for you at the moment. Yeah, well, yeah, it was. It's uh, hopefully tapering off now. Now, now it just comes the uh, easy part called finding a job. We'll see if that uh, <laughs> job, yeah. yeah, especially in the uh, current uh, environment. Um, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's a bit of a tough environment at the moment, isn't it, for everyone? Yeah. Right. Okay, that's going out there. All right. Again, guys, sorry. Um, I know this is not enjoyable for you at the moment, but I'm just trying to get the links out on our social media sites so we can get as many people in. Um, but yeah, Todd, like, why don't you start talking about um a bit about your like career? If you can give us like a background of yourself and how you started, and you know where you are today, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to give the uh, condensed version. Um, I am I am notorious for being long-winded, so I will try to give a very condensed version. <laughs> um, yeah, so I graduated from North Carolina State University in 1998 through the Air Force ROTC program. I went to U.S. Air Force undergraduate pilot training at Vance Air Force Base for primary on the T-37. And then, uh, well, I should say, Prior to that, I spent a year holding or waiting to go to pilot training at Shaw Air Force Base, um, working with the F-16 simulator. Then went to Vance on the T-37, then uh, uh, volunteered and was selected for a, a unique program where the Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force train students to go to the C-130. So I went to the T-44 King Air at NAS Corpus Christi in Texas with the Navy, um, which was an interesting experience. Out of there, I got my first choice of Hercules assignments to Ramstein Air Base in Germany. Uh, but first, I went to the uh, the OCU, as the British would call it, or the FTU, as the uh, U.S. Air Force calls it, the Flying Training Unit, to learn to fly the C-130E model. Did that, and then went to Ramstein, Germany, where I flew the E model there for three years and started off the initial OIF Iraqi Freedom uh, campaign from there as well. Uh, flew a couple missions for that and did a lot of Bosnia uh, and Kosovo missions. Then went to Pope Air Force Base, North Carolina, for four years, again flying the E-model. Uh, did quite a few deployments to Ali al Salim in Kuwait uh, for Operation Iraqi Freedom and a few Enduring Freedom missions in Afghanistan. And then uh, was, again, very lucky. I, I've got to say my career, I've been very lucky all the way through my career for assignments and locations. And um, was offered the British Exchange for the first C-130J USAF British or RAF Exchange at RAF Lynham. So... Came back from a deployment, went to a quick conversion course onto the RAF, or sorry, to the C-130J at Little Rock again, and then went to the exchange program at Lynham and Bryce Norton and flew on 24 Squadron and 30 Squadron, where I flew for quite a while um, and really enjoyed it. It was uh, probably the best uh, posting of my career and uh, did uh, one Telic debt and four Herrick debts. Then after that, had to go do a staff tour at Ramstein again, again, very lucky. Went to the 603rd Air Operations Center, where I worked in the Air Mobility Division for three years. Uh, I should say on my exchange tour, I met my wife, who's in the Royal Air Force, and she got a co-located tour out at Ramstein with me working in the NATO Air Headquarters. After that, there was only one way I could get back to the UK, which was uh, basically uh, beg the assignment officer to, for anything in the UK and found out that there was another NATO job that was available at the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, which is an Army Corps headquarters for the British Army and for NATO. And so I worked in the Air Operations Coordination Center there, uh, worked with a great team of folks there. It was a mixture of nationalities, branches, you name it, and um, went on exercise quite a few times with them. And from that point, I realized that I was at my retirement point and it was the only way I could stay in the UK with my family was to retire. And so retired here. Um, and now, like was just saying earlier, I have done quite a bit of training for uh, getting a teacher qualification here to teach um, sixth form history and public services at the college level. And, and that's basically it in a nutshell. I hope that was a quick synopsis. Probably went too fast, but I'm happy to answer any questions about that career. Yeah, awesome. 
So yeah, guys, uh, like who uh, join us now? Get your questions in. Um, uh, obviously, uh, Todd flew the C one hundred and thirty, so get your questions coming in. But uh, Todd, I've got a question for you. Um, sure. Which model of um, Herc did you prefer to fly? Well, it's a it's an interesting question because uh, as we've spoken about earlier, uh, the C one hundred and thirty E model I spent two thousand hours on, so I spent most of my time on the E model, which is the older C one hundred and thirty. Most of them are produced in the uh, mid sixties to early seventies, and um, I quite enjoyed that because it was uh, there was not much technology. It was very much seat of the pants. Uh, and working with a crew, uh, a larger crew, and flying an older airplane, but a very uh, dependable airplane. So, and, and I deployed a lot with it. So, I, the E model was a lot of fun. Um, the J model was an extremely different airplane, and uh, but had some amazing advantages, such as more powerful engines, uh, heads-up display, moving map displays, uh, you name it. So, the situational awareness in the J and the power in the engines on the J um, was absolutely incredible. So. Kind of two ends of the spectrum. Uh, it's tough for me to choose between the two, to be honest. Absolutely. And you see, there's uh, a few uh, questions coming in there, Todd. Yes. So uh, I'll let you answer away. And if you need me, just give me a shout. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Enjoy, mate. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. So I'll start off by saying hello to everyone. Good evening. And um, well, good evening, I should say, in the UK. But um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I'll start. Uh, Looks like uh, GB's Model Zone, impressive book collection, just like my bedroom. Yes, I, I do have a fair amount of books. Um, I am trying to uh, uh, whittle that down a little bit, but uh, I very much enjoy reading military history, not just aviation history. Um, uh, I do enjoy reading about uh, tanks, naval history, you name it. So, so yeah, I've got a little bit of a hobby my wife would call an obsession. But uh, let's see. First question. Were you primarily on the C-130? Yes entirely on the c-130 i um flew the c-130e model the h model and the j model um i did get a little bit of time in the f-16 when i was waiting to go to pilot training but uh literally riding in the back seat of a d model which was a lot of fun but uh not really qualified on it but um but yes yeah, so primarily on the c-130 and that was to sorry i should have said that was to chris holden so thank you for the question uh start down jin zong i, I apologize if i pronounce the names wrong what is it like flying the C-130 on low-level missions? It is phenomenal. It's a fantastic experience, especially at the uh, in the uh, I should say the front end of the air, airplane. Um, it's a very comfortable ride. Uh, the airplane is extremely maneuverable. Um, as you can probably guess, the only one thing we would uh, ask more for more of would be speed. It is a little bit slower than you'd like to go, but um, but it's an incredible airplane down in the low-level environment. It's it's designed really well for that, and we spend a lot of time in the low-level environment. Um, even at night on MVGs, night vision goggles, um, down 500 feet off the ground, 300 feet off the ground, landing on dirt strips at night. It's, it's a lot of fun at, at low level. Next question. Uh, uh, let's see what I said. Uh, James Taylor, what's your favorite patch from your extensive collection? Well, that's a tough one. I would, there's two, I would say. The well, first one is an AC-130 gunship Spectre gunship patch, which was given to me by an AC-130 Spectre gunship pilot in the early 80s who was one of my father's best friends. And uh, I think I must have been about eight or nine when he gave me that patch. And that kind of started it off along with my father's uh, army helicopter patches because he was a Cobra pilot. And uh, so that started on the patch thing. Uh, let's see. Chris Holden again. Did you ever manage to have any experience on fast jets? Yes, I got about, well, I hate to even admit it, but I got several rides, more than a dozen in the F-16D models. So I got about... 20, 25 hours, 28 hours in the F-16D. Uh, any countermeasures like flares or chaff on the C-130 versus missiles from Jin Zhang? Um, yes, the majority of Hercules do have countermeasures such as flares or chaff uh, installed on them um, for, for those, that exact reason for countermeasures against uh, surface air threats. Uh, F Jack. Hello from a hopeful RAF multi-engine pilot. We'll be watching with interest. Well, yeah, good luck to you. I, I can only tell you that I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was uh, a great time uh, on the Hercules. It was an amazing airplane and it was an, a, a great experience to be part of a team. To be on a crew was fantastic. Um, the load masters, the engineer, flight engineer, the navigator. Um, it, it was really good to have a team going at it on, on, the, uh, on the C-130. The, everybody had their roles. 
everybody worked well together and it was a good experience. And you had a lot of friends when you're on the road. Uh, let's see. Jen Zhang again, how is crew resource management allocated to the pilot and co-pilot? Um, well, we tend to trade off quite a bit between pilot and co-pilots. Um, and it depends on which Air Force you're talking about and also which uh, C-130 airframe. In the J model, both the pilot and co-pilot were quite a bit busier. Even though we had all the glass cockpit and all the uh, heads-up displays and everything, we didn't have a navigator and an engineer anymore. So uh, we had to do quite a bit of more work than we would have on the older model in the E&H. But uh, crew resource management was absolutely fundamental to all of the airplanes that I flew. Uh, you had to work together as a crew, and it was extreme. It was very obvious and very unsafe if you didn't. I'll uh, keep going. Vincent Todd, what was your most scary mission? Well, that's always a, a fun one to answer. I I have to say, and it's rather ironic because it was similar to my father's scariest mission, flying in a in a helicopter. Um, my scariest mission in a Hercules was over Africa, um, flying between Mali. We'd just come out of the quintessential or the iconic Timbuktu and going to the Cape Verde Islands and we flew into what later became a quite a severe thunderstorm over Senegal. Um, it, that was a scary experience because there was quite a few violent updrafts and downdrafts and hail and lightning and um, the radar was iced over so we weren't getting a good picture and yeah it was and it was also my first uh, mission as an aircraft commander so first real mission where I'm responsible for the crew in the airplane. So, but we, we made it through it. We got through okay, and the airplane wasn't damaged. And yeah, that was scarier than being shot at. I'll put it that way. Uh, let's see, another one. Uh, let's see, Jin Zhang, what is the heaviest payload you ever flew? Well, uh, again, on the numbers, hopefully I remember the numbers correctly, but um, I'm trying to think. The heaviest airdrop load that we would ever carry would be the road grader, which I believe was 36 or 38,000 pounds. Um, I never carried the road grader, but one of the planes in front of me in the formation did once, and I watched that going out of the back of the airplane, and you could watch the center of gravity shift massively as it went out the back. But um, but yeah, heaviest, I'd say probably we've carried Humvees, artillery pieces, you name it. Um, yeah, you can, generally about 40,000 pounds, 41,000 pounds of cargo. You can carry a bit more depending on how much fuel you're taking as well. Uh, let's see. What else? Have you flown through the Mach Loop in Wales from Vincent Todd? Yes, I have on two occasions, and that was incredible. The last occasion was ironic. I was in an RAF C-130J and was flying with a German exchange pilot, so a German and an American in an RAF airplane going through the Mach Loop. So, but uh, yeah, fantastic experience, really good low-level environment. Um, but I've flown through some other fantastic environments, the fjords in Norway, uh, up in the north, and then also out in the, in the uh, west in, in America, out in Arizona. Some incredible uh, terrain to fly low-levels through. Right. F. Jack, how did RAF USAF flying differ from each other? Was it easy to blend into RAF life from the USAF? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Mike and I talked about this in the last interview. And um, when I showed up for the RAF exchange, I was still fairly new to the J, but also they were going to put me through the second half of the captain's course uh, regardless so that I'd learn the RAF procedures, which was fantastic because the RAF procedures were very different. The checklist was done differently. And as I said to Mike earlier, um, everything had just converted into metric on the RAF C-130Js as well. So all the numbers I knew from the USAF J didn't apply anymore. Now had to be converted to metric numbers, which were much harder to remember. But um, but the RAF guys were fantastic about helping me along with that transition, and it was um, it was really good to go through that course. But as far as flying wise, um, yeah, I, there wasn't a lot of difference in the way we flew. There was a few things. The um, pattern around the airfield has flown differently uh, the USAF pattern is a bit tighter the RAF pattern is a bit uh, wider but um, yeah, there's I would say minor differences except for the way the checklist was run and the metric conversions that, that was the two big challenges there right uh, wow lots of questions here Jin Zhang is there any difference between RAF and USAF philosophies as far as airlift command uh, not particularly, really. Uh, it was a similar process on how missions were tasked. It was just more of a scale difference, uh, the USAF being obviously a larger air force. Um, and we did a lot more formation 
uh, training in the USAF than we would in the RAF. Right. Can you do barrel rolls or vertical loops with a Hercules or are you G limited? Jin Zhang. That's a fun question to answer because we always used to joke around that you can do anything once. Anything once. Doesn't mean you'll survive. Doesn't mean you won't crash, but you could do anything once. But uh, no, actually, you can't do any loops or barrel rolls in the Hercules. May, we might have tried it in the simulator a few times and uh, it might have worked, but uh, yeah, not something you'd want to do in the airplane. And, and yes, there is a G11 on it. Uh, now I'm really going to struggle here. I think it was three, three Gs positive. I don't remember what the negative G was now. Uh, it wasn't much. It might have been negative 2.4 or two, negative 2 Gs, I forget. But three positive Gs on the hurt, which in a, it sounds like not much. But in a transport airplane, when you're sitting on a flight deck, three Gs, when you, if you pull that in a brake turn, for, for example, feels pretty heavy. <laughs> it's... Um, we would re we would regularly do a brake maneuver where we'd go to 60 degrees of bank and pull two G's around the turn. And um, if you were standing up on the flight deck, it would probably put you on the floor. So, yeah. Hiya, Todd. Uh, just to, like, uh, interrupt yep. you there. Um, if yep, you can sure. try and not move uh, the Mac a book, because uh, we're getting okay. some, like, uh, we're getting a bit of, like, a uh, muffly sound when you move it around, uh, right. just okay. if that's okay. Yeah, sorry about that. If I need to repeat anything, I'll, I'll do that. I'll try to keep it steadier. It's bouncing on my knees. Here. Yeah, no problem at all. It's just like yeah, we get uh, like a bit of fluff in our ears here. So like I probably okay, use for that. So yeah, you, you can carry on there, um, Todd. Okay. Yeah, so go for it. Right. Uh, have you seen the Blue Angels C-130 flight demo? What is your opinion on their demo from Jin Zhang again? Um, yes, I have seen it several times. I've been unlucky in the respect that I haven't been able to fly on, on the Blue Angels C-130. Like a couple of my mates have, but... Um, yeah, the demo is fantastic what they do. Um, you know, it's a lightweight Hercules. It's got a gloss paint scheme on it, uh, light fuel load on it, no cargo in the back. So when they come and do a high speed pass at 310 knots, that's it's smoking for a Hercules, but it's expected when it's got that kind of, um, configuration. Um, the, the takeoff they do with the Jado bottles, which they don't do anymore. Uh, they're not, don't have any more Jado bottles is quite spectacular. But they're switching to a J model, which won't have the Jado. And I can tell you from experience that the J can climb out incredibly steep without the Jado bottles. So I think the Blue Angels demo with the J model will be just as good. Uh, let's see. Air crew interview from Mike. Did you prefer flying with the USAF or the RAF? Well, hmm. I've got a lot of friends on both sides, so I, I'll have to uh, sit in the middle here. I would say that there was pros and cons to both. I very much enjoyed flying with the RAF. I can't stress that enough. That was a phenomenal experience. And not just the flying, the, the squadron life and life on the on the station, all of that was ex phenomenal. Really enjoyed that. Uh, the USAF experience, you know, we deployed a lot, did a lot more formation, airdrops, that kind of stuff. Um, but we had a lot more rules as well. Um, but I flew with some fantastic people in both Air Forces. I mean, just that was probably the luckiest I've ever, ever was, was I had some really good crews. Really good maintenance guys, really good ground engineers, crew chiefs, you name it. Uh, both of them are phenomenal in both Air Forces. Right, Dan Alviera, Al I think it is. Hi, I would like to know about the short takeoff and landing ops on the Herc mission prep and concerns like load, runway landing, takeoff roll, CG limits, and maybe RTO or fully committed landings. I assume that's a running takeoff or talking about a touch and go maybe. But um, yeah, the the one of the bread and butter uh, things about the C-130 is we can take off and land in sh on short strips. Uh, for the USAF, it was, and for the RAF, I believe as well, um, was 3,000 foot long strips. And 3,000 feet sounds like a lot, but if you think about it, most little private airstrips for Cessnas are 3,000 feet or most of them are actually 5,000 feet. So 3,000 feet to put an airplane that is 100 feet long uh, is quite an impressive thing and, and a lot of fun as well. And we have to we put out a 500-foot box, and we try to land in that 500-foot box. And if you don't touch down in that 500-foot box, you go around and try it again because you won't be able to stop in the distance uh, left if you land outside of that box uh, generally. Or you'll land and have to jump on the brakes so hard you'll heat them up and burn up the brakes. Um, but yes, short takeoffs and landings were something that the Herc really prides itself on. 
Uh, you might remember the the Desert One mission as well. The, the plan B was they were going to have another Hercules that they'd modified with retro rockets, and we're going to land it in a football stadium and take off with 100 people in the back. So, yeah, the Hercules can do some short takeoff and landing very well. We have uh, instant power uh, on those engines with those props on them, and you've got the, the big Fowler flaps. Um, so you've got big flaps as well, so you can come in fairly slow. Right. Uh, next question. Jen Zhang, do you feel multi-engine pilots have easier transition to civilian airlines compared to fast jet pilots? I can only speak from a multi-engine pilot perspective. I would say yes, because you're used to dealing with asymmetric thrust, multiple engines, and working with a crew. That being said, I know a lot of fighter guys that have gone uh, airlines as well, and they've done fine. So, uh, yes, I do think it would come easier to the multi-engine pilots going from the military to civilian. My child, are there any multi-engine types other than the C-130 that you would like to have flown? Hmm, good question. If I was thinking nostalgically, I would say yes, the, the C-47 or the Dakota. I'd love to have flown that. If I'm thinking current airplanes, um, yeah, the A-400, I think, would be a lot of fun to fly. It's, I know it has some issues, but uh, performance-wise, the airplane has got some incredible performance, uh, and I think it would be a, a real joy to fly it. Uh, let's see what else. Xin Zhang, what is the flying? What is what? What is it like flying the C-130 with one engine off? Do you have to apply a lot of rudder? Depends. If it's an outboard engine, you have to apply more rudder than you would if it's an inboard engine. If it's an inboard engine, you have to apply probably very little rudder. But obviously, if you put the power on, um, then you need more rudder. Take the power off, less rudder. That's it. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's it in a nutshell. Um, if it's an outboard motor. Um, and I'm trying to think because on the EMH model, I think it was number one was wor worse, and on the J it was four. But um, yes, you would need a little bit more rudder uh, on uh, an outboard engine, and you do practice it quite a bit in the simulator. But three-engine flight in the Hercules, unless you're really heavy and some other factors uh, loaded in there, uh, is fairly – I won't, it's a bad term to use, but fairly simple. Um, we, I've flown three-engine on the Hercules many times. I think I've shut down probably a, a dozen engines. So, right, uh, let's see. What is your opinion of the Airbus A400? Jin Zhang, uh, yeah, pretty much already answered that. I think it's a phenomenal airplane. I know it has some issues, in particular in the freight bay or the cargo compartment. And, um, yeah, uh, but I think it's got some incredible performance on it. The technology in it is phenomenal. Um, and there's quite a few Air Forces flying it, so it must be good. But, um, yeah, so that's what I think on the A400. Adrian Chard. Have ever been posted to uh, X Hercules base? Have you ever been posted to X Hercules base RAF Linum cruise? Uh, I did. Yeah, I would spent two and a half years at Linum. Uh, I was there when Linum closed, or closed for the RAF, and then did the last six months at Brise. And I, I loved RAF Linum. I think it was a phenomenal station, and it was uh, honestly I'd, I'd been there before on exercise, and so I knew the station, um, and I loved the location as well. And, yeah, just loved everything about Linum. Um, my wife chuckles because she thinks, well, you can't. I love Swindon, but, yeah, I actually like Swindon as well, which always gives a, a bit of a chuckle to most Brits. But, uh, but no, I did fly a lot, quite a, quite a bit at Linum. Chris Holden again. Like other pilots on both cargo and fast jets that have written books, is this something you have thought of? Uh, yeah, I, actually it is. Um, I, well... well. Once I get this teaching certificate done and, and get uh, gainful employment again, yes, uh, I would like to probably write a book. Uh, I'm actually hoping to write a book with a friend of mine, a British friend of mine who's a historian as well. Uh, we're hoping to write a book on RAF Dakotas during the Second World War. Uh, there isn't much out there actually on RAF Dakotas during the Second World War, so that's something we'd like to do. But uh, yes, writing. I have written a few magazine articles and done quite a few book reviews, so writing is something I would like to get into. and. and Writing my own story or, or beginning with my parents' story and, and then into my story would be, yeah, something I've thought about, definitely. That right. book wouldn't be uh, with Paul, would it, if you know what I mean? Paul. Uh, the Dakota book? Yeah. Oh, no, uh, no, it's with a friend of mine named Clive. Ah, right, okay. I thought it might be uh, with... Uh... You know, Paul, I won't say his second name, but you know what I mean, uh, Paul, oh, yes. the Chinook yeah, yeah. pilot. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I know who you're talking about. Yes, yeah, so I'm sure yeah. we could write an interesting book. <laughs> we'll <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Drinks. Absolutely. So, 
Yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else? Jin Zhang, have you flown or ridden in an AC-130 missions? And if so, how does it feel like with the gun recoil? I have not flown on the gunship, unfortunately, but I have uh, several mates of mine or fellow crew members that did fly gunships, and I did speak to them quite a bit about... Sorry, I keep moving the laptop. I'll stop doing that. Um, it's a bit of turbulence, obviously. Um, uh, I've talked to quite a few guys who flew gunships, and they absolutely loved it. Um, but no, I've not flown on the gunship. Uh, let's see... Let's see, uh, Jin saying, are all low-level missions purely manual, or do you have auto-terrain following radar? In the regular C-130s, the slick C-130s as we call them, we don't have terrain following radar, no. Uh, the only C-130s that did have the terrain following radar were the MC-130Hs, uh, the Talon IIs, uh, and the Talon Ones, the previous ones before that, the MC-130Es. I think the MC-130Js are trying to get that in there. I'm not sure if they have that yet. But, uh, but yes, it was all manual flown at low-level. That being said, the J, you could put in auto throttles and you could set, you know, your speed and everything so it would do the throttles for you if you wanted in. And you could engage the autopilot, but generally low-level environment, you'd want to keep the auto throttles. Oh, sorry, the autopilot off. Uh, let's see. German Luftwaffe will, sorry, Alexander Vader. German Luftwaffe will get a small number of C-130Js to complement the A-400. Sensible idea? Absolutely. Obviously, I'm biased. I do like the Hercules, but... Um, Yes, with the current issues with the A400, even though it's a very capable airplane, I think it is sensible to have a small fleet of C130s. Um, you know, something like 50 countries around the world fly the C130, so there must be something right about it. Um, and yes, I think it is a good idea. I know about the, the operation you're talking about where it's going to be joint with the French. I think 10 Hercules based at Orleans, 4 and 6 for France and Germany. And the French have already got the first two. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good, a good idea for Germany. Uh, let's see. Next, PF. Do you still fly with a flight engineer, or is it all glass cockpit now? It's a good question. Uh, the C-130J is all glass, so no, there are no flight engineers on the C-130J. Um, on the slick C-130Js, there are no navigators either. On the special ops C-130s, there is still a CISO, as they call it, a combat systems operator, which is uh, a navigator that's had a bit more EWO training and ECM training, that kind of thing. Um, but on the C-130Hs that the Air National Guard still flies, and a lot of countries around the world still fly, yes, there is still a flight engineer and a navigator on those co in those cockpits. Uh, let's see, Dan Oliveira, how does it feel starting? How does it feel to start doing low levels on the Herc, and does the aircraft handle sharp at the speed this mission these missions are done? Yes, absolutely. Um, Dropping into the low-level environment in a, in a Hercules or, or flying in the uh, low-level environment in Hercules is great. Uh, the airplane handles really well. Um, I did mention earlier that it's much better ride up front in the cockpit for the loads in the back and the paratroopers or the passengers in the back. It is a bit less fun. Uh, people, it is a bit warmer and people tend to get a little sick. It's a bit bumpy. Um, the further back, the fuselage, the bumpier it gets. But, um, but no, it is phenomenal at the low-level environment. Uh, it's extremely maneuver with those speeds that we fly. Um, yeah, it's, you can really turn a Hercules, and you can really get down in the, in the weeds, and it. it's a great airplane at low level. Uh, let's see. Jude Maul, how does the 130 compare with landing? Oh, sorry, uh, with handling quickly compared to the A400. Uh I've not flown the A400. I've got quite a few mates that fly it who are ex-Hercules guys as well. They say it, it, it flies fantastic, the A400. Uh, it's faster than the C-130. It um, can carry more cargo, but um, you know it's kind of in between a Hercules and a C-17. Uh, but as far as flying the Hercules, I imagine that the A400 flies very similar and probably even better. You've, you've probably seen the A400 demos at some of the air shows, and it puts on an incredible display. Um, the Hercules does as well. You probably saw the Lockheed Martin guy that did the one at Farnborough a couple of years ago. And, and uh, yeah, so you can, you can uh, really uh, sling the Hercules about. Right. Uh, let's see. Some great. Yeah. Will Whitaker, how long will the RAF keep flying the C-130Js for? Well, that's a good question. For a while there, they were tempted to stop flying the RAF C-130Js and go to straight A-400s. But the... Issues with the A400 has basically uh, pushed the RAF to keep the C130J. Um, but that being said, the C130J is still doing a sterling performance for the RAF. So um, 
I think you will see the RAF C-130J stay for at least another 10 years. I think 2030 is a safe bet. Uh, they did phase or retire most of the Mark 5s, which are the short body um, C-130Js, and have kept most of the Mark 4s. I think there's 14 or 13 or 14 left. But, uh, yeah. Shenzhen, do you have any special procedures with parachute Paratrooper parachute jumps. Uh, absolutely. I mean, every kind of airdrop has its own special procedures. Uh, whether it was free fall parachutist or whether it was static line, whether it was out the parachute door or whether it was out the rampant door. Um, we have different speeds. We have different uh, uh, procedures for them. Yes, uh, it, it'd take me an hour to just explain those procedures. But basically, paratroopers, we dropped at 130 knots in the USAF C-130s. Um, and, yeah, I, I think the RAF drops them at 120 knots. But basically, the slower you can go, the less um, <laughs> the less shock to the paratrooper going out the door, I should say. It's, it's a smoother exit for the paratroopers, the slower you go. But we put down flaps 50, and uh, then we have air deflector doors that go out to, again, shield some of the uh, slipstream and the wind blast coming off of the aircraft as we're going through the air. Right. Uh, let's see. Jude Mall, is there a particular reason for a regular two ship from East Anglia? I don't know in particular. If it's over in East Anglia, it's probably the MC 130Js out of Milton Hall. So it might be just one of their preferred low level routes that they do. Not sure on that one. Sorry about that. Mike Child, are there any similarities between the C 130J and the older models and how they feel to fly, or are they essentially totally different aircraft? That's a great question. I'll tell you what, when you show up to the J model uh, FTU in Little Rock, uh, if you're a former C-130 guy from one of the older models, they will tell you, forget everything you know about the older models. This is a completely different airplane. That being said, yes, it's operated differently. Yes, there's glass cockpit. Yes, there's less crew members. But it, the, a lot of the procedures were the same. A lot of the speeds were the same. Uh, the airplane flew like a Hercules, but flew like an older Hercules on steroids, if that makes sense. Lots of power. So, Tony S. Hi, Todd. Judging by your backdrop, you look to be a book buff. What are your favorite aviation books? Oh man, that's a good question. I didn't. Hmm. Uh, wow. I think uh, just off the top of my head, there's a couple. Um, the Guts to Try by Colonel Joe, Joe Kyle. He was the on-scene commander at Desert One in Iran for the uh, failed rescue attempt in Iran in nine, April 1980. That's a great book. Um, oh, geez, what's another good one? Good one. Uh, Green Light about the uh, troop carrier C-47s that uh, took off out of, um, I want to say it was Membury or Cottesmore for that book. I'm trying to remember now. The Green Light, fantastic book. It's about the 80, 81st Troop Carrier Squad, I believe. Another great book. I'll keep going, though. That's two, uh, two for you there. Uh, have you done much in-flight in refueling? How much of that type of flying is on auto? Looks incredibly manual. Be able to re react to the turbulence. The slick C-130s don't do any aerial refueling. The only aerial refueling in the Hercules is done by the special ops, uh, such as the MC-130s and the AC-130s. As far as whether they do that manually or autopilot, uh, I'm fairly certain it's all manual. Uh, you can't really do much on the autopilot there. I have practiced it in the simulator. The RAF uh, Js had probes on them, um, but because of a State Department rule, I couldn't deploy to the Falklands, so I wasn't allowed to get uh, air-to-air -air refueling qualified. So I tried it in the sim a few times. It looked, looked like it's not too bad when the weather is nice and you're flying straight and level. But at night in the weather, it looks like it could be a bit of a challenge. Uh, let's see. Jinzang, what is it like flying Jinzang again? What is it like flying the C-130 in instrument conditions? Um, great. It's got a full instrumentation suite in it. Um, do you have an auto flight director or is it a traditional scan of instruments gauges? In the E&H, we had an autopilot. Uh, it was an older autopilot. Some of them are even off of the B-29. Um, but, yes, you did have – you could hook it up to the instruments, even on the E and H model. Um, and you could theoretically fly um, coupled, as I'd say. Um, uh, and you could, uh, definitely could fly up at high level in, on your routes on the autopilot in the E and H. And in the J, you do the same thing. You fly, In fact, you fly mostly on the autopilot, and you can fly coupled. In fact, you're encouraged. Uh, and almost required to fly a couple of approaches most of the time in the J. Right, Vincent Todd, long live the Herc. Absolutely. Uh, let's see, Will Whitaker, what's the aircraft that does the most hands-on, buried in classic style flying out C-130J, C-17A, 400? 
Um, well, I can only speak for the C-130J, but I would say it, was probably, it is probably the C-130J. That being said, the C-130J does preach and does uh, espouse flying autopilot as much as possible. Uh, the, the kit is in the airplane there to help you, and it is phenomenal what it can do when it's all coupled up. Um, and with only two pilots up front sometimes, it can get really busy. So if you program it right, it flies it right. That's the main thing is you got to know what you're programming it. Uh, Vincent Todd, and I apologize if I'm going too fast. I'm trying to get as many questions as I can. Vincent Todd again, what are the highest and lowest altitudes you have flown in the Hercules? Um, well, let's see. Uh, highest. Uh, think the highest I ever went in the Hercules, I know I went to 36,000 feet, which isn't, you know, not that high when you compare it to airliners and stuff, but we generally stay down low because uh, prop airplanes, you don't get as much. Uh, as much performance up high, and you, you're that slow that the they, the ATC guys don't want you up there because you're slowing down all the other traffic. But uh, 36, I know I've seen it in um, in a Hercules. As far as low, I've seen 100 feet. We we get down to 100 feet sometimes. Not in most low level environments, but certain low level environments you could go down to 100 feet, and that is um, quite an experience. Things are going by fairly quickly. Uh, let's see. Your favorite type, uh, Keith Thompson, your favorite type of mission from the C-130 capabilities. I loved flying formation, and I loved doing airdrop. Anything that was tactical, that's what I really loved. Um, those were my favorites. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dan Oliveira, what's our favorite mission, mission profile? Uh, kind of what I just said earlier, but uh, probably day uh, formation, but I'd say smaller formation. So like a day two ship low level, uh, to go out and do some airdrops together and then do some uh, formation maneuvering. That was a lot of fun. We used to do what we call TFM, tactical formation maneuvering. That was a lot of fun in the use of Uh Chin Zhang, do you get vertigo using MEGs? You can get vertigo using MEGs. The, the bigger issue with MEGs is um, depth perception. Uh, MEGs are phenomenal and they really, really help when you're landing on a a very dark strip at night and it makes it nice so you can stay blacked out as well or use IR lights and that way the bad guys can't see you. But depth perception I think was the hardest thing on MBGs, knowing how close something was to you when especially when you're trying to land. Uh, but vertigo, yes you can get vertigo as well too. What would occur? What do you think about the current RAF's pilot training situation? It takes several years to train multi unit pilots. Yeah. Um yeah, that is in my opinion not very good. Um, in training, you should have each block of training as close together as possible. And having blocks where you have a gap of a year in between blocks, you have to spend quite a bit of time getting back into the rhythm, getting back into your cross-check scan, that kind of thing, and getting that feel again. Um, but I understand the challenges associated with the RAF flying training program as well. They, um, when it switched over to mostly a, a contract support and um, the numbers of aircraft downsized quite a bit and squadrons closed, I can see where the challenges come in. So it's not an easy way to, there's no easy solution to fix it as well. Uh, Todd, what's your favorite C-130 t-shirt flying graphics? Yeah. Hmm. Let me think. It would have to be the flying graphics C-130 Hercules t-shirt. Um, yeah, no, that that's obviously one of my favorite t-shirts. I wear it frequently. Probably need to order another one because I'm probably wearing it out. Um, I do have another one. Uh, I know it's probably heresy to say, but there's another one that I got from the advanced airlift tactics course that just has a herc on the back eating up grass and there's no level like mo level but uh but yeah love the flying graphics uh, c-130 t-shirt to be honest and i'll put a plug out there i love all the flying graphics t-shirts i've got i've got probably a dozen or more right uh chin zhang how did you do navigation gps or dead wrecking inertial waypoint um in the enh we had a dual ins that also had gps as well same in the j um Originally, they had all kinds of older nav aids in there. Uh, they had ring, ring laser gyros, that kind of stuff. But now it's all INS with a GPS backup. With the navigators did do a little bit of dead reckoning, uh, and especially when we do low levels, we do a lot of uh, chart reading um, in the ENH. Uh, in the J, chart was on the moving map display. We had a paper one as a backup. Right, Jude Mall. Have you ever flown over the U.S. or Canada? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my granddad trained in Lancaster over in Canada. I did quite a few missions over in Canada. I spent a lot of time at St. John's over in Newfoundland. Really enjoyed St. John's. Uh, uh, let's see, where else did I go? Uh, Gander. Gander's okay. <laughs> the RAF likes to go through Gander quite a bit. The USAF likes to go through St. John's quite a bit when you're doing transatlantic 
uh, missions. But that being said, I did take um, a gazelle in the back of an RAF C-130J all across Canada, all the way over to, um, oh, I forget where it was now. We, we went everywhere, really. Halifax, Winnipeg, um, Trenton, and uh, where we, we went out, out to the west. I can't think of where it is now out in the west. But yes, I have flown over Canada quite a bit. Um, I also got to take a King Air to the London, Ontario Air Show when I was a young student pilot. That was a lot of fun as well. Uh, let's see. One of the main Alexander Vada. One of the main problems of the Grizzly comes from the software, which derives from the A380. No such issues with the 130J, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean they do have software issues in the J. Um, all airplanes do. Um, they have different block updates that come out uh, for the C130J um, that have to be tested, and they do find some issues. Um, but yeah, I, I suspect there's a few more issues on the Airbus side. But the Lockheed side has been around for quite a bit. So, uh, Ian Kamrak, have you ever done an assisted takeoff or any kind, for example, JADO? No, I have not, unfortunately. Um, I have seen it a few times. Um, but like I said before, the J model with its unbelievably powerful engines in it, uh, you can climb out incredibly steep. I've climbed out 22, 23, 24 degrees nose high in J model, and it feels like you're almost going, I don't know, 60, 70 degrees nose high. It feels quite steep. Um, and it is impressive from the ground as well. Uh, but no, I have not done a JATO takeoff. Karen Shortland, are there any aircraft that you haven't flown yet but would like to fly if you could? I would absolutely love to fly as probably the quintessential answer to Spitfire. Uh, one of these days I'll save up some money and go, go for a flight on a Spitfire. Um, if I could have flown another airplane from history, we talked about this before, the Phantom would have been a, a great airplane to get a ride in. Um, and then some obscure ones like the, the F-101 Voodoo, or the uh, RA-5 Vigilante. Um, I'd love to get a flight in the Blis Bristol Blenheim. I'm a huge fan of the Bristol Blenheim. I know it was an underdog. I know it suffered horribly, but uh, just for the nostalgia's sake of it. Uh, Will Whitaker, do you know what the C-17 is like? Is it, I'm sorry, is it quite boring to fly in comparison to the C-130J? Well, obviously, being biased towards the C-130J, I'd say the C-130J is more fun. Um, but... That being said, I've got quite a few friends that fly a C-17, and C-17 is, you know, it's very capable, very maneuverable as well. Uh, it's got a fighter-like cyclic in the middle instead of a yoke. Uh, it's got a heads-up display as well, and it's pretty impressive. Um, but we do also make fun of the guys, and they're going to give me some ribbon about this later, but we always used to call it the Buddha. It's fat, sits on the ground, and everybody worships it. So there you go for the C-17. Dan Oliveira, how bad can the weather be for low levels? Uh, it depends on a lot of things. Um, you know, the RAF and the USAF had different uh, weather rules. Um, and to be honest, I've, I've struggled to remember the exact numbers. Um, but the low level depends. If you were in a, a wartime situation in a C-130E model with AWADS on it, which was the Adverse Weather Aerial Delivery System, we didn't need to see the ground. We could fly in formation in the weather. Um, leading a bunch of other C-130s in a ski formation, station keeping equi equipment formation, and we could drop without ever seeing the ground. So, right. Uh, let's see. But if you're talking viz and the height of the ceiling, I want to say it was three miles viz and 1,500-foot ceiling, but I, I, don't quote me on that one. I've lost the numbers these days. Uh, let's see. What do we got? Um the Freckle Puny, A400 or C130J. I know one is bigger and semi taskable but which do you rate the most highly? I'm, I'm always going to go with the C130J just because it has the proven track record. Um, the A400 is a very capable airplane and will probably um, build up an impressive record itself. But the C130J is definitely uh, built up an impressive record, and so I would, I would rate it more highly. Kate Wright, I want to be a pilot in the RAF, but I'm not good at mass. Could it be possible to try? Absolutely. And I will tell you that I was good at maths until it got hard. <laughs> Once maths started getting hard, um, yeah, I struggled. I really struggled. Um, in the USAF, uh, you have to have a bachelor's degree to come in uh, to the Air Force as an officer and to be a pilot. Uh, my degree was in history, so I wasn't very good at maths, as you can tell from that. But I also enjoyed history. As far as uh, the REF, uh, I couldn't tell you on the, the maths requirements, but I, I know you have to have a certain... Uh, math, score on your GCSEs, I think it is, or have a certain amount of A-levels. Um, but, you know, 
do what you can to improve your maths. I did take some courses to try to bring my math scores up as well. Uh, that was something I did. But good luck to you. And I would say keep pushing for that goal. It's worth it. Uh, Jin Zhang, is there any limits on max bank of the C-130? Yes, 60 degrees of bank is the approved limit of bank. Um, and in the J model, it will actually record if you've gone over 60 degrees of bank and record it on a card and tell the engineers afterwards. So, yes, yeah, 60 degrees of bank. Uh, the Freco Puny, would you have liked to have flown an AC-130 of any model? Um, yeah, uh, you, especially when you've been shot at and not been able to shoot back. It'd be nice to shoot back sometimes. But uh, I have seen the AC-130s working out in Afghanistan when I've been flying along as well and seeing them um, engaging targets and... Um, yeah, it would be a lot of fun. But uh, uh, the only thing that kept me back from the AC-130 really was once you go into the AC-130 world, you kind of stay in the AC-130 world. And I, I was still enjoying my time on the slicks and for a variety of reasons just stayed in the slick world. Uh, Karen Shortland, Spitfire is always a favorite. My favorite is the Lancaster. Thanks for replying. Yeah, no worries. Lancaster, phenomenal. I have crawled through that Lancaster, the BMF, and several of my friends have flown it. And uh, yeah, it's incredible what those guys uh, did during the war and flew in those. So it's just, I take my hat off to them. Absolutely unbelievable. It's in saying, what was the cockpit visibility like on C-130B? Not sure about the C-130B model, but but generally a Hurt cockpit is one of the best cockpits of a multi-engine airplane for visibility. We had in the E and H model, we had 23 windows in the cockpit. That tells you something. You had two windows down by your feet. You could see down below you, which was even better. Um, in the J, they took one of those windows away. So there's, uh, I think, two windows less. So it might be 21. But uh, no, the, the visibility in the Hercules is fantastic. The only thing we couldn't see very well was behind us. But as I mentioned in one of the other um, clips, we could put a cupola or a cupola, as we'd say in America, big bubble up in the forward escape hatch, and somebody could sit up on the top bunk and look behind us to clear for fighters coming in on us. So the visibility is good. Jude Mall, have you ever flown on a Hawk? No. And at one point, somebody did uh, said they could set one up, and I wish I'd taken them up a bit uh, more on that to offer. Um, but no, I've not flown on a Hawk. Uh, Zhang, can you tell whether an engine is failing or malfunctioning by the sound of the turboprops? Yes, very much so, especially in the E&H model. You, there was a bit of a harmonics or rhythm going to the props, and they, we had a prop sync mechanism as well that would sync the props to be uh, in uh, as close a harmony as possible uh, for a variety of reasons, mostly fatigue life on the airplane, but also for crew comfort and passenger comfort. But uh, yes, you very much could hear a prop or an engine starting to go, and I did hear... We had a gearbox explode one time on the number three engine, I think it was. And just before it exploded, we could hear a change in the prop and the noise from the engine. And as I was shutting it down, that's when it, the gearbox blew. But we managed to shut it down safely and, and landed in Sigonella in Sicily. Right. Uh, oh, John Ellis, ever done a roll or overbank to C-130J? I've never done a roll in a Hercules. I have in the sim, but not in the airplane. Have I overbanked the C-130J? Yes. And if there's a pilot out there who says he hasn't on the C-130J, he's lying to you. And then C-130J, it'll record it on the card, and the engineers will see it later. <laughs> so, yes, I have. Uh, Will Whitaker, how does a pilot like yourself, very experienced multi-engine C-130 pilot, get into vintage and warbird aircraft flying? Um, well... I'm not in, I mean, I have flown in quite a few warbirds through friends of mine uh, and such, but uh, as far as getting into it, like getting uh, your license to fly warbirds, a lot of it has to do with uh, knowing the right people, right place, right time, much like any other good job or fun thing you do, right place, right time, know the right people, have a little bit of money saved up as well. It is quite expensive. Right. Jude Moore, are you guys in touch with most airfields? I love the Spanish guys and gals as they fly over my parents' place over in Spain. Um, yeah, I mean, I flew all around the world, to be honest. Uh, I did most of my flying in Europe, America, Canada, and the Middle East. Uh, I didn't do any flying in the Pacific uh, area, so that's one place I never got to. What was the most beautiful landscape you ever, ever flown in your aviation career? Well, uh, that's an easy one for me. It was Norway. Flying in Norway over the glaciers, or glaciers, as you say, in the UK, um, and fjords. Afghanistan at night. That was quite impressive as well. Um, you name it. So I've flown over some impressive places. Uh, flying over my university for a football game. That was incredible. But uh, but Norway, I think, tops it for the uh, most beautiful landscapes. Uh, Adrian Chard. What did you enjoy the most? Night time or 
day flying in the Herc. Definitely day flying. I have a lot of time. I've got about a thousand hours on MVGs. Um, MVGs are phenomenal. And from a protection standpoint, yeah, it's better to fly at night from a threat standpoint, I should say. Um, but wearing night vision goggles on your helmet for seven, eight hours at a time is is uh, quite tiring. If you can imagine having two small green televisions. Half away from your eyes, that gets tired as well. But uh, definitely day flying. Uh, have you ever flown the, uh, down the Rhine River Valley? Uh, I just watched two USAF C-130Js do it today. Yes, I have. Um, yeah, when I was at Ramstein for three years, we uh, flew all over Germany, uh, typically in the southern part of Germany mostly. But uh, but yeah, flew down the Rhine a few times, um, flown over the Neckar River in Germany and a couple other places as well. But yes, it's a, again, beautiful terrain. The, the castle tour, as we used to call it. Um Let's see, Chen Zeng. In total engine failure, what is the optimal glide speed for a C-130? Great question. Really don't remember the numbers now, but uh, it would depend on a lot of factors as well. The weight of the airplane, um, the fuel load, you name it. Um, but uh, let's just put it this way. It's a, it's a high-wing, multi-engine transport airplane. The glide ratio or glide speed for a complete engine failure is um, not very good. We'll put it that way. Right. Freckle Bunny, how different do you think tactical transport and perhaps your career would be had the Boeing YC-14 or the McDonnell Douglas YC-15 been chosen to replace the C-130 in the late 70s? Um, I'm familiar with both of those aircraft. I've seen the one of them uh, out at Edwards when I was out there with the RAF, ironically. Um, I don't think my career uh, would have been any different. Uh, the tactical flying, I think, might have been slightly different, but Again, low-level airdrop is low-level airdrop, no matter what airplane you're doing it in. The, the point is to put mass on the DZ or the DZ, as the, the Brits would say, um, regardless of what you're flying. You want to get as many paratroopers on the ground in as short as amount of time. Um, so that isn't going to change. It hasn't changed since World War II. Uh, Keith Thompson, did you do any parachute training? Um, yes, not much. We did, For uh, pilot training, we had to do uh five like parasail things over the ground and then they let you go and you drop down to the standard parachute landing fall at water survival we had to do so many um parasails again over the water and then drop into the water and have to get out of our chute in the water um and then we used to carry chutes on the airplanes in the usaf hergs and so we had to do um like simulator training where they'd hang you up in a harness and use uh vr goggles and uh practice parachuting that way but as far as jumping out of the hercules no never done that uh, Dennis, divorced maker, what is the weirdest, strangest cargo you've ever flown? That's an easy one. I flew, and you're going to laugh probably about this, but I flew two hot dog stands, like portable hot dog stands, like you'd see at a fun fair, from Amman, Jordan, to Baghdad, from the U.S. Embassy there, along with a couple pallets of TVs and DVD players. So that would probably be the weirdest cargo uh, the other weirdest one would be I carried a Bosnian war criminal to The Hague one time um, from Bosnia. Uh, that was a very strange, interesting mission. Those are my two strange cargo or passenger missions. Uh, let's see. Dan Oliveira, flying the C-130 mission profile, props have advantage over jets like the Embraer C-390. Yes, they do. Um, I mentioned earlier, we have instant power. The props are running at 100% RPM generally. Um in a high 90 percentage to 100 percent but generally close to 100 percent and you have instant power over a blown wing um so you've really got more advantage you don't have to wait on the spool up time like you would on a turbofan or a jet engine i have seen the the uh Embraer c390 though at riyadh and it does look like an impressive airplane uh sounds going indeed is the sound okay uh, let me know if if it's not i'll see if i can do something about that Okay. Uh, Jude Ma, what, what's your next thing to do? Well, as I mentioned a few times already, uh, my other passion is history. Uh, I've got a degree in history and I got my master's and um, I've always enjoyed teaching and speaking and, and presentations. And I'm one of these people that doesn't get nervous, theoretically, in front of uh, an audience. And I love talking about history and I'm quite passionate about history and about flying. And so uh, I've decided to get my PGC uh, over here in the UK so I could teach. And uh, the plan now is to teach at the sixth form college level and eventually get the PhD and teach at the university level. Oh, questions are coming fast now. Whoa. 
Uh, I'll see if I can uh, scroll here and see if I missed any there. Uh, let's see. Thank you for the hot dog stand story. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There we go. Uh, I live in Oxford, sure, and Will Whitaker. I have grown up seeing the Hercs going over my house at low level is amazing, but not so much over the past few years. Yes, that's true. Um, sadly, there's less Hercs uh, at Bryce, and they're up at Bryce now too as well. Um, and they've been fairly busy as well, um, doing uh, missions over to um, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and Syria as well. So yeah, you're probably seeing a lot less now, unfortunately. Uh, wouldn't bailing? Sorry, John Ellis. Wouldn't bailing out if loss of all engines be recommended? Uh, it would be if you had chutes on board. <laughs> or, and didn't have passengers. But if we had passengers, the rule, I mean, obviously we'd stay with the airplane if we had passengers. Um, we only, we used to carry parachutes on the E and H model. Um, but again, generally in a Hercules, you're going to try to uh, land it somewhere, crash land it somewhere. There's very few situations where anybody's going to jump. There was a gunship that went down off of Kenya several years ago and they were in a, they were in a pretty bad fire situation and uh, some of them jumped and some of them rode it in. Uh, and the ones who rode it in all died and some of the ones who jumped survived, but some of the ones who jumped died as well. So it's uh, jumping is, is a challenging scenario out of a C-130 for the crew. Uh, let's see. Is fuel flow management automatically controlled by the computer in the Herc? No, it is not. Even in the J, it is manually controlled, unfortunately. So the two pilots up front or one of the load masters has to run the fuel panel. Uh, let's see. What's your first thing to do out of lockdown? Jude Mall. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, hmm. I think it would be go have a pint with some of my mates. That would be. Yeah. Happy hour with Mike. That sounds like a good plan. So happy hour with Mike. Um, thank you for the hot dog stands. Yeah. What was your scariest or most memorable flight in the C-130? Well, the scariest one I mentioned earlier was the uh, thunderstorm over Senegal at night. That was uh, not a fun experience. And ironically, the same thing that my father experienced in Vietnam. He got shot at much more than I did, but he said the scariest time he ever had was in a Huey over Vietnam at night in a thunderstorm. But uh, let's see. When do you think the last Hercules will come off the production lines, given it has the longest continuous production run for any plane in history? That is true. Um, I'm not really sure. They are still producing J models. So I think it's safe to say that they'll still keep producing them for at least another five years, maybe ten. John Ellis, was the Bosnia flight done with fighter escort? No, it was not. It was, uh, it, it was, well, fighter escort wouldn't have been needed. It was in 2003, so it was quite a ways, uh, quite a uh, long time after the majority of the Bosnia war. But, um, but yeah, no fighter escort. What do you think of the movie Top Gun and the tongue-in-cheek reference to a certain cargo plane out of Hong Kong? Yeah, I much like uh, most of you, I watched Top Gun. I remember going to it in, in the cinema in 1986 and watching it and yeah for a few years i thought that's it navy fighter pilot definitely want to do that but prior to that i knew i wanted to be a military pilot anyway so that just solidified it um and the rubber the cargo plane flying out of hong kong yeah I, you know what it, i felt like i was in that role a few times in the hercules strange cargo mission could have been die hard too yes definitely uh scrolling down trying to catch up sound is back again Good. Uh, an amazing teacher. No, I'll, I'll, I can definitely improve. That's for sure. I feel like I am speaking too fast and I apologize for that, but I'm just trying to get through all the questions if I can. Um, but thank you for saying, uh, I very much believe in teaching, but I also very much believe in being enthusiastic and passionate about what you want to teach. Um, we'll see how long that lasts, but, uh, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Dan Oliveira, there is some aviation history outside the Herc world. What's your, that's your favorite. Oh, probably what's your favorite? Um, I've got quite a few actually, but um, I studied uh, the Battle of Crete is one of my favorite battles to study. Um, I've studied the German paratroopers quite a bit. Um, oh, what else? What else? Um, I, World War II is pretty much. I, I study just about everything in World War II. I've learned. I've studied quite a bit about the Eastern Front. I did quite a bit of research on the Holocaust. Uh, I prefer learning about special ops, uh, particularly famous operations such as Bay of Pigs, uh, Desert One, uh, the Sante Raid, those kind of things. So those are just some of my favorites here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sounds good.
Uh, I assume it's it's getting darker here. Hopefully everyone can still see me, but uh, all right. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll take a look at what's left here of the questions here. So here's, uh, how likely are all four engines failing on a C-130, and how do you rate the survivability of the aircraft? Extremely rare for all four engines to, have, to fail on a C-130. I've shut down a single engine many times, but uh, the ultimate situation in the Hercules is to go two engines out on the same side, and we practice that in the simulator all the time. And it can be quite an experience, and I almost had to do it once, but I kept that second engine running uh, and landed because we st were only about 20 minutes out, and it still had enough oil to keep going. So, uh, And I was above the recommended weight for two-engine operations, so I kept it running for a bit. Right. Uh, Air-delivered British beer. I'll tell you what. I, yeah, I, I do love British ales. Doom Bar is my favorite. Put the plug out there for them. I'm not being paid by them. Um what do you see the RFC 130J is mainly doing in the coming years in terms of missions? I don't, I don't see it changing. I see them continuing to do the same missions they've been doing for decades. Um, yeah, um, but they do it well, and I take my hat off to all the guys still doing it. Air to air refueling, I'll skip that. I didn't really do much of that, uh, but uh, I would say it's probably definitely not easy, especially at night in the weather. Have you ever flown mixed formation with fast jets? Yes, that'll be. Um, yeah, I got to fly with A-10s. They used to protect us quite a bit. I've flown uh, against F-16s, did a bit of dissimilar air combat training with them. That was a lot of fun with Norwegian F-16s and USAF F-16s. I uh, had some fan German Phantoms drop in on us one night on a night formation, but uh, didn't really get to do much with them. Uh, oh, and I had a French Mirage intercept me one time. That was fun. Um, Mirage 2000. Uh, carry any famous guest. I've been around a lot of famous guests, but strangely, they all went to the other plane. I ended up carrying the baggage most of the time. But uh, I have carried some NFL cheerleaders. Um, I've carried quite a few generals. I carried the chief staff of the Army. I carried uh, one of your um, famous generals, um, uh, Sir Richard Dannett, I think it is. Uh, I carried him one time from uh, Kandahar to Muscat. He was quite a lot of fun to talk to. No, I've not done any exchange with any other countries seen a film called the devil's brigade i do not but i have i know the story of the devil's brigade and so you need some books on about the german brandenburger units i'm aware i've i've read i've studied the brandenburger units and i have a couple of books on them but uh yeah but i think well, that's most todd, of the question. well todd that was an absolutely brilliant q a and i want to thank you very much for coming on and uh yeah hopefully the questions were okay for you yeah, absolutely. And thank you to everyone for all the questions. I, the passion that your viewers have for the Hercules is, is very evident, and I appreciate people asking those questions. Um, I would I'd just say again, I was in the right place, right time. I was very lucky to get to do what I did. And, um, and it, was, it was all down to working as a team with various crew members and my ground engineers, uh, the crew chiefs, the maintenance guys, admin people, fuelers. It was all, I hate to say the party line, but it really was one team, one fight. Everybody was all part of one big team. And if any of that drops, you know, or any of it doesn't work right, then it stops. And Absolutely. Uh, and, was, uh, yeah. and can I be cheeky enough to ask you online? Can you, would you be up for another Q&A at some, uh, some point in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And as people can tell, like I said, I'm a bit long-winded. I'm sure I can talk for hours about various topics, but uh, particularly about the Hercules. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. I want to thank you very much, Todd, for coming on. And uh, yeah, I want to thank our viewers for asking some absolutely great questions. And again, guys, uh, yeah, hopefully we can get another Q&A with Todd in the future. And yeah, it's it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you very much, Todd. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mike. Talk to you later.